Hello, it's uh, John Rob here, interviewing Danny McNamara from Embrace about the band's new album. So Danny's, the album, it sounds like a grown-up record in a sense, you know, like uh, thematically, lyrically, and even musically. I don't mean it's gone like really boring. It just sounds a lot more dramatic and sort of deeper as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a lot coming from you. Um, well, I mean, I am 51, John. You know, so if I've got to grow up at some point and I can't be like the perpetually 18 till I die Cliff Richard vibe, you know. Um, no, um, I uh, met my wife about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, everything everything changed for me, you know. Um, uh, I think uh, that the title of the album, How to Be a Person Like Other People, is sort of, it's taken from um, the script for the film with Joaquin Phoenix. You know, the Joker. Um, there's a bit in there where he is watching Robert De Niro's chat show host um, and he's watching him introduce the guests and he's watching the guests like pick up a drink and walk on stage and stuff. And he's watching how to be a person like other people. And I just, I thought that phrase really sort of captured it, you know, like um, I was a pretty, um, I had a pretty wild imagination as a kid and um, found it quite isolating. And I'm quite, I think oddly, even though I'm in a band, I'm actually quite, I introverted really, um, uh, but then I met my wife and she sort of helped me uh, join the human race. Um, there's nothing like having a, a three-year-old and a two-month-old to snap you out of being in your imaginary world. You know what I mean? <laughs> you have to go to their imaginary world, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. I mean, was that the kind of appeal of rock and roll? Maybe in the first place, a place for for people who aren't normal people who can't, who can't fit in and feel about the outside sort of drift towards you like so you and your brothers and your friends in your youth yeah I, I definitely um always felt separate and when you left uh I went to Ipham Grammar School and when you left there it was either you got university or you got Halifax Building Society you know, like the gates opened up there and everybody just went there. And I just thought, I really don't want that. I, I, you know, that's I don't want either of those things, really. And, um, yeah, joining the band, it's, it's, I wrote a line on, um, on the album number six, uh, which is the winner of the rat race is still a rat. And that's how I always felt about it. I always felt... Yeah, you know, my mates would sort of showing off about what cars they'd got and and, and all that, and I, I was just like, none of that really bothered me. None of it seemed to mean anything, um, and I just didn't want anything to do with it. So, I kind of, I suppose, in a way, joining the band was sort of running away from real life, really. Mm. I mean, and you you'll, you'll yeah. know that you're in a band. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's about you, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did music, and it's, it's interesting this because you can sort of look at your career in two parts as being half time in a way. So, did music help you make sense of the world when you were younger? And can we throw that question back at you now as you're older, but in a very different kind of way? Um, well, I mean, when I was a kid, I was a pretty anxious kid. I used to worry, like, one of the first ever things that I ever said to my mom after mummy and daddy was, it's dark, you know. That was the first, sort of, one of the first sort of things I said. Uh, I know it because it's written in this little book that they had. Like me being the first child, I had all the photos and the little books and all that crap. My brothers don't have any of that stuff. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I was quite a sort of, um, you know, scared little child. And my mum used to sing um, Close to You, you know, the Carpenters classic. Um, and... And she used to sing me to sleep every night. And and I still sort of, I mean, I sing it to my daughter now, but um, I, I, I sing it to myself when I, when, when I want to sort of self-soothe, you know? Um, and, yeah, I think, I think definitely music. You know, uh, Elvis died when I was six, so I was like, I want to be that guy. Because he was on TV all the time, and I just, I just thought... Um, 
Elvis's like the way the, the thing about it was that he would snap a string uh, on his guitar because he was playing it so hard. And I just thought, yeah, he means it, man. That's that's the height of passion. You know, as a six-year-old, I was like, yeah, that's real soul, that. Um, and then, yeah, throughout my life, it's just sort of always been there. Sort of, it's a little bit like a whole food, you know, like rice, you can live on it. But it's it doesn't, it's, I, to, say, to say that I didn't really have work-life balance uh, would be an understatement, you know, and my relationships and pretty much everything else in my life um, took a back seat to the band. The band was like 95% of my bandwidth. Um, and it's only recently that I've sort of allowed other things in and, and, and that's really what this album is about. It's about letting real life in. I mean, how does that affect the creative process, not just lyrically, but, but musically? I mean, it sounds very much like an embrace record, but also it sounds there's a, there's a grandness to it and a scope to it that in some ways wasn't there before, a, a maturity, like I was mentioning before. Yeah, um, well, I think I've got more urgent about it. Like, uh, uh, now I'm 51 now, and um, I'm aware that I don't have forever anymore, you know, mm. and so I feel like each new record is like, almost more urgent than the last in a way because time's running out, you know, life's too short, you know. <laughs> and also I don't want to waste my time on something that I don't like. So if I didn't like it, I just wouldn't do it. I don't need to do it, you know. Um, so it's, it's and, and also any, any sort of compromise, any sort of commercial considerations or whatever, they've all gone. Like I'm not, I'm not really worried about any of that anymore either. So it's just purely, you know, art wanting to express myself, and and um, and and I feel like I'm, I'm I'm quite a young soul in a lot of ways, in the sense that um, I've kind of uh, put off growing up for a really long time, <laughs> um, and. You know, now, like, there's nothing like having kids of your own to, to sort of help you kind of grow up, but um, it doesn't come natural. It's my normal life, and, and but my wife's really sort of, she's almost like titrated it for me and gives it to me in little doses every day, you know, <laughs> sort of pulls me in the, in, the, in the kicking and screaming sometimes, but in the direction of where, you know, other people are and where, you know, things that, that I might enjoy if I was just like everyone else, you know, the things that I'm always too in my head and too busy thinking about the next song or whatever to really be engaged in the moment. And and all that's kind of... I, I, I wouldn't say that I was I was ace at it yet, but I'm, 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 every day I'm getting better. And this new album is sort of really uplifting and 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 like you say sort of epic and, and stuff um because it's quite a fucking big deal <laughs> <laughs> to suddenly join the human race is quite like <laughs> you know what the fuck there's there's sort of like i mean there's in a way there's a sort of a sense of like grief that i, I hadn't done this sooner you know like um I remember this story like when I was young at youth club. We used to go to this youth club and play, you know, Sob Cell and Adam and the Ants and all that back then in the day. Um, I was about 9, 10, 11, around there. Um, and one week they cancelled it on a Friday and there was like this old silver lining barn dance thing there. And I was like really sulking. I sat there. I'm like, I'm not dancing to this rubbish. You know, I'd, it's like... It's, if it's not um, if it's not madness, I'm not fucking interested, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it went on from like six till about eight or something. And uh, all my mates were up and dancing, and you know, silver lining. It's like it's a lot of old ladies. So all those young men, you know, as ten, eleven year old men were like, "Come on, be my partner," <laughs> sort of thing. And all my mates got up and went for it, and I I was the last to get up in the last half hour. I thought, "Oh fuck it, I'll do it." And I got up and I had the best time of my fucking life. It was amazing. I absolutely loved it. But like, 
I just regretted that I hadn't started sooner, you know. I'd, I'd only had half an hour of fun, whereas all my mates had been there for two or three hours dancing and having fun. And I feel like that, I sort of feel like I'm late to the party, in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I want to play catch-up, you know what I mean? But I'm doing yeah. songs it's like um, shit's done believe you or 90 percent of other people go duh I, look, I knew that in my 20s mate you know um yeah and, and so there's a lot of inspiration there so um so yeah probably the next album might might come along quite quick because it's uh yeah there's, there's a lot to say <laughs> a lot a lot i want to talk about it initially was a, a fear but you lose your creativity you lose your rock and roll or no i, I it's. I think it's just. I mean, yeah. I. I. I am quite introverted. I sort of retreated into my shell, and sort of. I think um, some people found me quite aloof. Um, but I was just. I won't say shy, but just. Um, I never. I never engaged in the moment because I was always really in my head. And I don't think it's a fear of engaging with the moment. I just found, like, the stuff I was imagining more interesting, you know, if I'm being honest. Like, I just, um, you know, writing a song was more interesting than going down the pub, you know. Um, but I've been for a lot of therapy, and, uh, and um, it sort of opened up the idea that, like, actually just sort of coasting a little bit and just being a human being and not trying to be something or be impressive or climb the mountain or, you know, whatever it is, or be driven or have so much fucking purpose is important in itself. And um, and, and and also replenishes the, 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 the creative stuff as well. You know, it's like you can't create in a vacuum forever. Hmm. Um, I mean, what, what sparked the therapy then? Oh, that was, um, yeah, a, a long relationship ended uh, and it was really messy and really heartbreaking. And, um, and yeah, I just, I just went to pieces and, uh, yeah, went for therapy and um, met my wife while I was halfway through therapy and carried on because it was a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, but I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm cured because it's a funny word that, but yeah, I'm a lot happier now. I'm I'm happier now than, than I've, I think probably than I've ever been, maybe since I was a kid, really, you know, since I was that six year old wanting to be Elvis. Yeah. I mean, so so musically, did it change the way you the creative process and writing the songs? I mean, not the music itself, not the lyrics. Um, well, COVID did that. Um, because we couldn't get together and the album was recorded during COVID. Um, so what happened with this album, which is pretty unique really, is the band, instead of we, what we normally do is we get together as a band and Rick bring his ideas, I'd bring my ideas and then we'd jam them out as a band and, you know, you might have a chorus or a verse and then I'd go away or Rick goes away, we work on it we finish it, we bring it back and start again. And then we try like 95 different versions of the song and then usually land on the first thing we did is the best. And then, yeah, all that. <laughs> just a lot of, I mean, I'm sure you know, being in bands, like just a lot of uh, the accelerator's down full, but the wheels are spinning like fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with this album, and to a certain extent with the last album, we wanted to make sure that we had all the songs completely written, lyrics, all parts, before we went in the studio. So that when we go in the studio, it's just a case of laying it down. And we can, because we're a good live band, but because we traditionally write in the studio, we're always exhausted by the time we come to doing the tape. You know, we've, we've been working on this fucking song for three months. How are we going to play it as fresh as Daisy now? You know what I mean? Um, and, and so conversely, what would happen then is a lot of the B-sides and EP tracks where we just lay it down, I'd have all this great feel and the albums would be, some of the album stuff would, would, be, would be quite sort of produced and a bit slick. Um, so with this, it was basically a case of like eight of the songs are Richard's ideas that he sent to me, no, seven. 
no, six, six of them are Richard's songs. And then one is one that Richard wrote with someone else. And then a couple are Mick, Mick, you know. And they just um, emailed me ideas, literally like hundreds of ideas during COVID. And, and when I got a great melody to it, then I would then be right, okay, I need to write middle eight, I need to track chorus, I need to write blah, blah, blah. And I'd do all that work out. And then we'd do a demo with Mick and Richard, just sort of keyboards, guitars, like an acoustic demo. And then we'd give that out to everybody and everybody go away and work on their parts and email us their ideas because everybody's got their own little porter studio. And then when we thought, basically, we've got it now, we just need to lay it down in a take. We just come in. And what would normally be, like, even with one like youth, you'd maybe be one or two days laying down a track. Uh, normally on our own, we're like maybe one or two a week. For this album, we were doing like three a day. And it was just so much fucking fun. It was like I was able to go, if it's not having it after a couple of hours, let's scrap it and move on because we've got more songs. So whereas in the past it'd be like, no, we need this to work. So we're at month three now, but, you know, it will work at some point if we just, you know, and and, and you can get good stuff that way. But um, I think this way is more fun for everyone. It keeps the vibe in the room up. You end up getting great takes um, that are more like you are live. Um, and it's probably going to be a lot more fun to play live as well because it's it's just the five of us in a room. There's not a lot of overdubs on there. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting because it does sound like a, like a big sound. Like I said, it's very grand one. So it does sound... Well, we've been at it a while, John. <laughs> no yeah, way. I know, but it sounds like there's a lot of things going on in it. It doesn't sound... Right, yeah, yeah. You no, know, guitar, yeah. bass, drums, keys. You know, there's, there's yeah. they're big, aren't they? They're epic sounding songs. So... Yeah. Is that, that's just, I guess, in a lot of ways, that's just using space, isn't it? Not overloading, yeah. but not going yeah. total spectre on it. Can actually make yeah, it sound yeah. oddly bigger. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the, a lot of the tracks sound bigger just because Mickey Dale is like, it's like Bruno Martelli off uh, Fame or something. <laughs> it hits the keyboard and suddenly you hear fucking flamingos and violins and all sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, Richard is is really great at producing as well, and he, you know. For us, it was like we wanted to get all the guitar in there first, and then because otherwise, if you let Mick in there too soon, it'll make it sound amazing, but it'll be all just the stuff that he does, you know. Mm. Whereas if if you sort of get all the guitars and you get it work, it's just four of us. Then he has to sort of find his way in, and quite often when you do that, you get you, you'll get a more exciting result, and um something like Rubble on the album, uh, which I think is one of the best things he's ever done, if not the best. Um, basically, our Richard got this really great guitar stuff and he's sort of laying down the gauntlet. And then Mick goes, right, well, there you go, fuck you, you know. <laughs> and there's there's a real, like, uh, creative sort of jousting going on because Mick was like, well, I like this, I like this. And, and then in the end, I think we've ended up with something that's a really good sort of blend of both worlds, you know. And, and there, there's, there's, there was a lot of that pushing and pulling in the studio for this one, which is always good, you know. Mm. I mean, is the actual creative dynamic within the band change over the years? So it's, it's always been very much the same process. Everyone's a writer. You sort of push stuff around each other, and it's quite democratic. Um, on the first album, I was quite dictator, quite a dictator. I had really sort of set idea in my head what I wanted. And um, but I wasn't able to get it. Like I didn't have any skill at all. Um, so I'd just be sort of frustratedly like telling everyone in in, sure. in you know like talking about architecture or, or, or what, what's the <laughs> one dancing about architecture. It was like like I was speaking a different language, and and we sort of eventually like someone would, oh, that's it. That's what I meant all along. You know that sort of you know what that's like. Yeah, um, yeah. The second album was a real reaction to that. And basically, it was like, you shut up, Danny, just let us have some fun. Um, yeah. That was a, now, a mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> not really a mutiny, but, you know, I mean, I, I went home one day and then they, they all recorded Hooligan, like, you know, so. Yeah. And I really loved it. We put it out as a single, but um, I had nothing to do with that. I didn't, I didn't play anything on that. Um, but yeah, that was that. Uh, and then 
after that, I think now it's like we all know our place. We all know what's important. We all sort of listen to each other. Um, I'm impatient. I'm really impatient. Um, but I think that that can be good because it sort of keeps everyone on their toes a little bit. Um, it's better than ever, though. I will say now it's better than ever. Like, you know, it feels like we can we can almost just do it. We can just do it and it just happens. Whereas in, in the past, it was it felt much more like sort of dragging the square wheel up a mountain, you know. Mm. I guess so over the years, if you look lucky in the bands, people work at understand each other. You know, you get that communal mind, the doors thing, don't you? Whatever, we just kind of... Uns- Unknownly, just knows, don't they? Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely some of that going on, um, you know. And and I and I also find that the less I do, you know, and the more I let it be what it is, the better it generally is. Um, so mm. it's, it's sort of this weird dichotomy between being really impatient and wanting everything yesterday, but also letting it be. And there's a weird mix in the studio that you just have to instinctively feel out and. But it really worked on this album. Mm. I mean, when, when they're presenting the piece of music, I mean, do they know the mood of the lyrics or is it about matching them? Well, does that not even matter? You know, you can make the mood of the lyrics match virtually any piece of music they provide. Um, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, it, it, it's like... It's like I just instinctively sing along, like la la la, along to it, and then usually I get a melody. But as I'm singing, I'll be making words as I'm going along. So quite often, a lot of the lyrics will just pour out uh, without any any sort of thought or intellect or, or anything going into it. And then I'll sit down and I'll be like, "What's this about? Like, what am I really singing about here? Like, you know." And then I go through, I've got like books and books of lyrics and ideas and thoughts that are just piled up. And anything that vaguely sort of gives me the same sort of feeling, I then drag all that over. And then I start then sort of working on it in earnest. And what usually happens is the sort of first three or four days, I get fucking nothing at all. And then I get into a zone and then I can usually do one or two a day lyrically and finish them all off. But it's the the most important thing is that it has to say something to me, and I have to figure out what that is. There's a there's one on the album, um, the last track on the album, and it gave me a feeling, but it wasn't about any women. Like you know, normally it's about oh, some woman. Normally for me, um, mm-hmm. the end of a, usually the end of a relationship. Although some of the, a lot of the ones on this are at the beginning or, or, or the sort of the being in love element, which is which is rare for me. I've never really done that before. I've done it once before. Um, but this song wasn't didn't have any of that. It's like, it's none of that. Well, what is it? I love it. What is it? And then it occurred to me, it's about my daughter and about how I feel about my daughter. And and I, you know, I was like, oh my God, this 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 is her, this vibe is completely it couldn't be more her. Like about that feeling of of like having the whole world in front of you and but being completely open to it and not worried you know um and and uh and then as soon as i figured that out it took me a couple of weeks to figure out that because i because i knew i liked it i just had no idea what it was about and then as soon as i figured that out it just poured out you know took minutes i mean very much a, a dime of all yorkshireman do you find songwriting and the music is actually where you can express this stuff which isn't something that we know yeah, yeah. very, very good at is there, it? <laughs> I know what you mean there is definitely that least said soonest mended mentality <laughs> and I'm going to say that my family is very much like that like I mean I love my mum and dad to pieces but we don't really talk about our feelings much and you know we don't really have conversations much except for how is it going are you all right Normally, it's like uh, you know, I'll say to my dad. I used to speak. I used to speak to them every day over Zoom. With you know, I'd have my daughter with me, and we'd speak every day. And and the first, the opening line is, you know, I'll, and they'd be like, no, no, nothing's happening, you know. And the, and then <laughs> just play with Kate for a bit, you know, <laughs> talk to Kate on there. Um, 
so yeah, there is that um, definitely that mentality, um, and yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess that's why I became introverted because you know, no one really engaged with me. Maybe you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think some of the emotions you're trying to convey in music does it matter if the audience picks up on them or just interprets them in their own kind of way? Which is what a lot of people do with songs anyway. They they feel something, but maybe a different feeling than the yeah. writer intended. Yeah, it's a weird one that because they always love songs that you're not that asked about, <laughs> and and aren't that asked about songs that you absolutely love, and it's like there's there's some frustration in there. Um, you know, they're like, oh, that lyric means so much to me. And I'm like, well, that, that's like, yeah. well, all right, okay. <laughs> but then, you know, equally, you get loads of people that really get it as well, you know. Um, and, 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 and when some, whether someone does or whether someone doesn't, if they get something from what you do, it's a huge honor, definitely, you know. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and I still feel that someone comes up to me, even if it's like one of the songs where I, I don't think much of it and it's, I mean, you know, they got married to it or whatever, and it means how much to them. It's still the fucking loveliest feeling in the world, you know? I mean, you have a very close relationship with your fans, don't you? Yeah, yeah. We, we um, over lockdown, we did a Patreon uh, called Secret List. And on that, we, we like, stuck out all the outtakes, all the, it's like, it's like about 60 songs that we've never released that was sticking out on there and we do like quizzes and tutorials and um, interviews and there's all sorts of old footage of us recording the first album and all the early days stuff before we even got signed and so we've, we've done a load of that and it's been it was really wonderful of a lockdown because we have this massive archive of stuff and it's not like Frank Zappa's that's amazing but it's like it's pretty big it's pretty big um and and Steve, our bass player, really got into editing all the videos together. And so every week we just have this uh, fantastic film of us back in the day, like 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. And it was just a real trip down memory lane. And I, I think in a lot of ways it really sort of sustained us through the pandemic, you know. I mean, it was a pandemic, I mean, you touched on this before, but a chance to take stock, not just of your own life, but of the band as well, you know, this way... You know, dealing with your own history, looking at your own history, and you know you could carry on in that sort of space, or maybe a chance to change it. You know, go and try and do something else. Try and try and up the ante of your own history. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel like we've done that with this. It's it's it is that sense of like the end, the end is near almost. So it's like we don't we don't have time to mess around. We, let's make this. Out. and it's like now it's like with each album would I be happy if I died tomorrow that this was the last Embrace album and if I'm not then let's leave it as the last one man because you know it's, let's leave it let's leave on a good one you know um, and I just I just think because I know the way that we work and our priorities now that that we won't be pushed into doing an album that's not where it needs to be um, you know, I think, I think, yeah, like, like, like I said, like life's too short. But I think the pandemic was a, was one of the positives that came out of it. Is I think people learned a lot about themselves. You know, I think um, because when you're up against it, you see what you're like, and when you're scared or you know, because at the beginning it was really. Frightening, you know, like people were dying in lumps, and you're like, "Oh my god!" Uh, and, and and you re- we really sort of saw, you know, some people came out as conspiracy theorists. Some people, it's usually um, usually a I'm not being sexist, but it's usually a middle aged man who's like, "Don't worry, everything's going to be fine," you know. <laughs> um, and then and then other people are like, "Oh my god, don't even breathe when you go outside," and you know. <laughs> Everyone had a different sort of defense response to it. Mm. Um, and uh, and I think we learned a lot about each other from that, but we also learned a lot about ourselves, you know. Uh, it, it's, it, for me anyway, it definitely um, made me think about priorities. And, 
And one of the things as well, coming back to this, how to be a person like other people thing, is that what really struck me is how much everyone missed being sociable and being with everyone else. And I really didn't. Like, it, it didn't affect me at all. I was, you know, I'm, all, I'm almost always at home. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so it, I didn't suffer. And, and in a way, because I didn't suffer, it made me feel really lonely that everyone else was mourning this life they've got. And I'm like, I don't have that. Like, what the fuck? I need to sort that out. <laughs> You know, and that's again, that's that's where this this album sort of born out of that wake up call, really. You know, and but yeah. I've heard like a lot of creatives, a lot of other writers felt the same way. Like, actually, being in the pandemic was kind of nice because they didn't have to do all this, you know, social uh, <laughs> obligation stuff. That you know, it's like I could just be me and and not worry about all that crap. Um, yeah, so, so kind of kind of like existing within the, the wild imagination you talked about before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so when the band started, you know, did you have any idea that it was built for longevity? I mean, I, I, I don't mean when you're 16 or something, but as, as it kind of went on, you know, because I mean, when, when I was growing up on bands, it was always about you would have two albums and that would be it, you know. Yeah, yeah. The, but maybe it's different yeah. for bands in your generation. Maybe, maybe what's like, you know, this is a thing that we could do all our lives. So was that just something? Gradually made sense. Well, I mean, yeah. When when our first album came out, we were never in any doubt that we were going to do the whole fucking U two thing, you know, like ten albums and stadiums and blah blah. blah. It just felt like hit or something. And then when the second album didn't do as well, it was like a real wake up call, you know, like <laughs> whoa, what you mean? This it's not all set in stone. Like what the fuck? And then when the third album did even worse and we got dropped, it was like, all right, okay. <laughs> right, we should have been, we should have spent more time enjoying that and less time planning for what was going to happen in the future, you know. So then, when the fourth album came out and did really well and better than any of the other albums, um, better than all the other albums put together, which is amazing, um, we made sure that we fucking enjoyed it, you know. Mm. And then since then, that's really what it's been about. It's been about being in the moment uh, as a band and, and enjoying it not taking it for granted um, and just enjoying the ride and um, and it being about uh, all about the art and not about commerce. You, you, when you have too much of an eye on the commerce, it, it everything suffers, everything. Everything suffers. The commerce suffers. Everything suffers. I mean, would you say that was true in the second, third album? It was a pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, I, I think the second album was like a reaction to the first. That we just thought, let's just go and have some fun. We can't do anything wrong, so let's just go and have some fun. And it's like, well, you can do stuff wrong. Look, <laughs> I, I still love that album. There's still a lot of really good songs on there. Um, but we, I think, it's if you could accuse it of anything, it's a little bit self-indulgent. Um, and then the third album was. I rushed. We didn't really have the songs. Um, and so we were banging our heads against the wall, sort of trying to make it work, you know, square pegging around all. And, and and so the album is probably our weakest, I think. And then it was like, right, okay, we have to go back to, uh, you know, back to brass tacks, start fresh. And we got, we, we got a bit of um, Everin's money out of the record company for doing the greatest hits uh, and we put it into building the studio and just spent three years writing and writing and writing like we were a new band trying to get signed mm. um, and, and and yeah and then, then it's just gone, gone on from there So you kind of put like a discipline even like a leather graft into it? Well I mean it's hard. we've always had that Me and, we've always had quite a strong work ethic um where re- I'm in particular really driven, and uh, you know, we in the studio it'd be like Richard would go in, uh, or I'd go in in the day, like sort of twelve till six. Then Richard would go in six till midnight, and then I would come at midnight, and sometimes not finish till three in the morning. You know, so we we were like constantly, and and we'd sort of pass each other like ships in the night, and it'd be like, 
you got out and it's like oh, a few bits nothing too exciting carry on and then every now and again someone like when Richie got the verse for Ashes it was like wow yeah cool that's really fucking good but that that verse we, we, we were like two years before we got the chorus for that that was so frustrating um mm. Uh, but then when you get it, you've got it, you know what I mean? And it was youth who, because uh, in, initially it was sort of this uh, quite, what youth would say, sleepy ballad. Um, and he came along in, a, in in the studio and he just he just said, uh, four to the floor. And I didn't even know what that meant back then. And Mike just hit the like, doom, 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 doom. And I was like, what? It's not a fucking dance track. Like, what? And uh, But then it really worked with the guitar. And before it even got to the end of the song, everyone in the room was beaming faces, you know. And, um, and the weird thing about that was uh, once we'd nailed it, I started getting really anxious because I thought, oh, my God, we're going to make it again. Like, yeah. we'd gone all the way down with the third album being dropped and everything. And, then, and, and this was like a completely new song. And it, it was before Chris Martin had offered his gravity. Um, and... And I just thought, Ashes, I just thought, oh, my God, we're going to be big again. Fuck. And it was really scary, oddly anxious, like, almost like because you don't have anything to kick against anymore if you made it. There's no purpose. Your purpose goes. It's like if you're not careful, you're like an elephant going to your grave. You know, you know your time's <laughs> up. When, you, when, you've, when you've done something that's really good, it felt like that. It really felt like that. Um, yeah, I guess the mystery of it gone as well, in the sense, you know, you know what's going to happen when you get there. It's just a... Another empty room. Isn't it? I mean, you can never know. I mean, this this industry is such a roll of the dice. You can write great stuff and go completely fucking unnoticed. But yeah, I just had a real sense like, oh my god, this could actually happen again. Shit. Mm. So, what, what's your sense now with this one? Um, I feel optimistic about it. Like, we are it feels like really rejuvenating and upbeat, and it feels like what the world needs right now. But the world is like such a like with COVID and and the war and the cost of living crisis. There's so much going on, so much pressure going on. It's it's really difficult to tell how it's going to do. But you know we're all massively proud of it. So that's all we can do. The rest of it is it's in the hands of the gods. You know. <laughs> 